Hello! In this video, we will provide an overview of important steps in a supervised learning problem using a simple linear regression example. We will discuss how we can measure the error of our estimators and discuss some techniques, namely gradient descent, to find the parameters of our models. Suppose you have a professor who wants to know the relationship between the average homework grade and the final grade in a course. Essentially, the professor wants to provide an estimate of the final grade of his or her students and is trying to use past information about homework grades as an input to obtain a prediction. The professor thinks that the students who are working harder, meaning that they have a better homework grades, some bit uh, homeworks on time, and so on, are more likely to get better final grades. This follows the general idea about supervised learning in which we have some input variable x and we want to predict or estimate an unknown variable y. In this case, the input variable is the average homework grades and the output variable y is the final grade and our ML box, our machine learning box, helps the professor to discover the relationship between x and y. Here, there is only one input variable and one output variable. But the ideas are very similar when we have multiple variables. How do we do that? First, we need some training data. Luckily, the professor has homework and final grades from the last few years and from many students who took the course. Let's say that we have M observations from X1, Y1, X2, Y2, all the way up to XM, YM, where the ith training sample consists of XI, which is the average homework grade for the ith student, and yi, which is the final grade for the same student. Now, we need to have a tunable box that learns the parameters of the function. This means that you have a tunable function. You can change the function by changing its parameters. Based on the training data, you can select the best tuning parameters to fit the function to the training data. Another way of thinking about this is that the box contains a large number of functions, and based on the training data, you choose one of them. Now, in this example, we will talk about how to choose the parameters of our model. There are of course many different options for these tunable functions, and we can talk about the pros, cons, and pitfalls of each. For example, let's consider a very simple set of functions. We can define a linear regression function as y equals to theta 0 plus theta 1x. It is a very simple approach for predicting a quantitative response y on the basis of input variable x. It assumes that there is approximately a linear relationship between x and y. Now, this function is tunable because the theta coefficients are tunable parameters. You can choose the value of theta 0 and theta 1 in a way that the function hopefully provides a good prediction of y. If I choose theta 0 equals to 0 and theta 1 equals to 1, then I obtain y is equal to x, for example. In general, for each value assigned to parameters theta i, we can obtain a different function. Let's visualize this tunable linear function. Here, theta 0 represents the y-intercept, and theta 1 helps us to identify the slope. So, by changing theta 0 and theta 1, we can obtain different functions. Of course, this cannot represent all the possible functions, but you can observe that there is flexibility to tune this function based on the training data and learn the parameters of the function. Now, if you look at the training data, each point represents the pair average homework grade in the x-axis and the final grade, which is y-axis. Maybe the range of the homework grades is from 0 to 1 and the final exam from 0 to 20. There are many tunable functions that can be represented using different coefficients. The question is, which one is the best to fit the training data? Let's take the following linear function in blue. Each point of the scatter plot represents one training example. For example, this data point xi, yi tells us for xi, the observed value of y is given by yi. However, the function gives a different value of y. The discrepancy between the real value and the one predicted by the function is the error or residual for this specific xi. We can do the same for all of the other data points and calculate the residuals for each data point. Looking at these errors, 
we can tell that this function is not a good fit for the training data. The observed residuals are too large and in fact the slope of the function is negative which is not consistent with the general trend of our training data. If you look at this trend, it shows that as x becomes larger, it is more likely that y is larger, which matches the professor's intuition that students that work harder on the homework tend to have a better final grade. Now, how do we find the best function? We can say that the best function is the one with the smallest aggregate error. Let's say we have this other function and as before, we can define the error as the residual or discrepancy between yi and y prime. These residuals can be positive or negative. So to get the aggregate error, we square them to make them positive and then sum them together. This error measurement is widely used in regression problem and is known as the residual sum of squares or RSS. There are other error indicators that could be used. It is worth mentioning that in a statistical computing, there are very useful built-in open source packages to perform these types of calculations. So you don't need to manually program them. One common library used for machine learning and statistical analysis in Python is SciPy and Scikit-Learn. They provide built-in functions for data pre-processing and training ML algorithms. They are open source and easy to use with a few lines of code. Now, how do we find the best parameters for the linear function that minimize the error? The answer is optimization. Well, you have some parameters theta and you want to choose them in a way that your error is minimized. There are different ways to tackle this optimization problem. One widely used technique is called gradient descent. The idea is very simple. We have two parameters theta zero and theta one, and we can think of the error as a two dimensional function similar to the surface shown in this figure. You can also think that the surface looks like a bunch of mountains and valleys and the error is minimized at the bottom of the valleys. However, this minimum point might not be the global minimum, but just the local minimum. The way gradient descent works is that starting at a random point on the surface, we need to move toward the direction of the minimum point. This direction in which we need to move is obtained using the gradient. The concept of the gradient is very similar to the concept of the derivatives in one dimensional functions. The gradient gives you the direction of the highest change in a multi-dimensional function, which points to the maxima of the function. Since we need to move toward the minimum value, we need to move toward the opposite direction of the gradient, and that is why it is called the gradient descent. Also, it is important to emphasize that, as we can see on our surface here, there are several local minimum and maximum values. Our goal here is to find the global minimum. So when running the gradient descent algorithm, there is a chance to fall into a local minimum and confuse it as the global minimum, which is not the optimal solution. The good news is that if you have a convex function, then you can always use gradient descent with no problem. If you have a function like this one, then there are methods to deal with this problem. For example, you can start at multiple different random starting points and see which one gives you the lowest point. Let's say that after running gradient descent, we obtain theta zero equals three and theta one equals 1.8, which result in the minimum error. The y prime line in blue shows the relationship between x and y. You can see that the slope of this function is positive, indicating that if you increase x by 1, then y is increased by 1.8. The positive slope and the trend of the data confirm a positive correlation. On average, better homework grades lead to a better final grade. In summary, in this video, we talked about the ML box. The ML model can be thought of as a collection of functions among which the best function should be found in the training step. This is the step where the parameters are learned in a way to best fit the training data. We talked about what is the best function to fit our data. The best function can be thought of as the one with the smallest aggregate error. Although, as we'll see in the next videos, there is more to the story. 
We discussed the concept of residual sum of squares, or RSS, which is a measure of how well a particular function fits the training data. We talked about gradient descent, which is an optimization technique to find the best parameters of the tunable function by minimizing the error. We provided an example of linear regression. We fit the training data to a linear function with only two parameters. However, the problem can be generalized to use more features, parameters, and different types of functions, such as polynomial regression. Now, how do we select these features? What types of functions are usually better? We will continue these discussions in the next videos.